it's really interesting to have seen both sides, both sides of the coin in terms of employee versus employer and the challenges of both. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, for today's episode, which will be a deep dive into the ethos of Blue Pencil Collective, or BPC, a Minnesota-based beacon of design excellence founded on the pillars of purpose and relationship BPC stands as a testament to community involvement and the relentless pursuit of sustainability. At the helm of this visionary enterprise are co-founders Casey Johnson and Regan Nix, industry mavens who've transcended gender norms to steer BPC toward a future ripe with innovation. With a combined 40 years of experience from esteemed design firms, they embody the ethos of the Woman Business Enterprise Certified BPC, championing inclusivity and progress. Regan, with over a quarter century of expertise, brings an exceptional array of residential, commercial and hospitality spaces to life. Her designs are a dialogue between aesthetic and psychology, weaving narratives that celebrate old world charm with a modern twist, inspired by her experiences across the United States and Europe. At BBC, she continues to redefine elegance, merging it with practical innovation. Casey, with a robust 14-year trajectory, narrates stories through architecture. Her tenure at globally renowned firms saw her pioneering roles that shaped design landscapes from New York to Newport Beach. Her designs a confluence of art and science resonate on a personal level, leaving an indelible mark on architecture and interior design. So this episode was really interesting because we spoke about branding and the the way that Regan and Casey had gone about working with uh, a branding consultant, how they've put together their identity and how they've been communicating that. We talk about partnership and how that survives, becomes stronger, and how they work together passionately and deeply with their clients. So really fantastic episode here. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Blue Pencil Collective. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. I was intrigued by another business that was addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently, saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near-native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. So it's time to announce this month's 200 Club. If you missed our episode on the 200 Club, listen to BOA episode 485 to learn more about this new initiative for benchmarking small firm performance. So big congratulations for this month's 200 Club winners, Drew and Justin Tindall, Daniela Aspana and Nguyen Ragasing, Irini Adams, Kimberly Dokes, Mark Elster, Christopher Brandon, Brad Hubbell, Andrea Nemechek, Gogesh Mystery, Marina Rabina, Yost Bende and Denise Burkett, Christopher Rawlings, Charles Scram, Lena Bola, David and Kristen Ware, Sven Levine, Judy and Larry Apel. Keep up 
the good work. Guys, we love it. Regan Casey, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good. Good. We're excited to be here. Excellent. Well, fantastic to be speaking with you. Very excited um, to actually talk with you guys about uh, Blue Pencil Collective, the wonderful, beautiful work you guys do, the residential work. You've got a really gorgeous portfolio. Um, and Thank certainly you. for me, one of the things that stood out when I kind of came across your work and came across your your website particularly as well actually was just how much connection there was with it it was very clear that there's you know it was it's people centric there's relationship there's emotion um and a, it was just a, a very warm okay that was a it was a very kind of clear emotional experience kind of coming in, into contact with you so welcome to the show it's very a, a pleasure to have you here and perhaps we can just jump straight in with why the name Blue Pencil Collective and how did you guys start? Well, um, it was really organic, actually. Um, it was something we talked about. We started in um, a large architecture and um, interior design company, and it was always our dream at lunchtime walks to open our own company and then an opportunity uh, literally fell from the sky in our laps and so we jumped on it and um one of the things that we always wanted to strive for and we knew that would be important um in the business is to always be editing and growing and never stop learning and so the meaning of blue pencil the literal meaning is um like editing and they use it in manuscripts and um different uh types of formats that can't be copied so although all this um editing and changes are mean being made behind the scenes the final uh product is what everyone sees and it's amazing so um that's how we like to think of our business is mm -hmm. um everything that's happening behind the scenes and all the editing and growing and then the abstract um way to think or the literal way to think about it i should say is the blueprints mm. like blueprints and it's all about like an evolution too is um, not just with us but us with our clients and just the business as a whole which is another reason why we didn't choose regan and casey um design and architecture it was it's always been a dream to be something bigger Mm -hmm. um, so making it not just about us, but about everybody who, um, touches BPC. Amazing. So when you first started, what was the kind of projects that you were winning and how did you, how did those projects come about? You said it, it was very fortuitous. <laughs> the first project was a residential and it was a rather large residential. We thought it was going to be, um, a friend's small cabin mm -hmm. but when he sent the drawings and what their vision was it was actually eleven thousand square feet so um <laughs> that <laughs> was uh, a full-time job for about two years um and then that kind of segued into additional residential projects um we had always worked in the commercial realm and healthcare and higher education and so this was really our first dabbling into residential, um, but it was so exciting. And the personal connection was something we hadn't been able to experience before hmm. with our clients. Um, so that was just so fulfilling. Great. And, and since then, how have you kind of nurtured uh, a kind of consistent flow of work into the business? How have you managed to weather the, the how, long, how long have you guys been going for? We just celebrated seven years in Amazing. January. So congratulations. Yeah, lucky number seven. Yep. Um, I think again it was really organic. I think building our portfolio, of course, has been um really helpful in um gaining those dreamy clients. Um and yeah, just really showing people who we are unfiltered um has really led us and led people to BPC um, that are the right fit. 
Great. Um, we, we mentioned a little bit last time we spoke as well, we were talking about the brand and obviously that was the, the you know, one of the things that I was trying to uh, kind of convey at the, at the outset there was the, was the, the feeling that we get. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've developed and grown your brand as the Blue Pencil Collective over the last seven years? Where did it, where did it start? What was it, what did it used to be like? What were some of the, the, problems or challenges that you faced and how what's the story of how it's evolved I think it's been a work in progress I think we didn't really know who we were at the very beginning and um, it's taken us seven years um, to get to where we are with the brand right now and it wasn't until I'd say maybe two or three years ago that we um, really started to figure out who BPC is um, because it it is really this like living thing that um, that we have to nurture continuously and um, decide who it is. So we met our brand team and they were the ones that really um, helped us define ourselves yeah. and bring out our personality. Mm -hmm. I think prior to having our brand team on, on and it, first of all, to finding the right brand team is is a challenge in and of itself yeah. because um, we were finding prior to our our A team brand team, um, it was really difficult to to express what we wanted and what we could envision. Um, and I imagine that's almost what our clients go through mm -hmm. as well is trying to have someone that just gets it intuitively who you are, what you're looking for, and can understand your vision um, without us having to say a whole lot. So um, when we found them, it was just, it was, we always say magic when you find that connection and it really was. And they were able to um, bring out of us what we had been trying to find for so long. And so now that guides us, that brand actually guides us in our conversations about our business. It guides us in every detail down to what we wear <laughs> um, <laughs> when we're representing the brand um, and who our clients are. It's just really been a game changer and it's so exciting. And, um, you know, it, it just changed our, our whole worlds. What was the process that they led you through and, and how did you know that they were the right fit? You know, were there, were there other brand agencies where you were like, no, this is definitely, that's not going to work. And yes. what, what was, what <laughs> were some of the deciders that had you settle on this, on the company that you worked with? Um, I think their process uh, was something that we really connected with right away. Um, it's actually a very similar, since it is a creative process, it's a very mm -hmm. similar process that we use with our clients. Um, and we've actually, we learned a lot from that process and applied it to um, how we lead our clients through the design process. Um, but yeah, just taking every milestone in baby steps um, was really important with us and just the, I guess, organic uh, collaboration that yeah. we had with them was um, really, help it really helped us um, give the feedback that they needed um, to uh, bring it to the, the next level. And, and I think it was the authenticity mm -hmm. of the relationship right. and the candidness of mm -hmm. it and us just feeling like ourselves and them, you know, gravitating towards that. What kinds of exercises did they do with you? Were they, were they keen to know like the kind of vision and the future of the business and, and help you establish um, kind of core values or what was that a lot of that already done? Um, we did, we had gone through several different types of brand exercises before um, our most recent brand or current brand. Um, but I don't think that we necessarily really used those. Um, I, she pretty much started from scratch, but one of the things that she did that was a little different was um, it was a type of like business personality test. Um, and ours was like explore and um, we both had to do it separately, but it was about the business. And then our final. Our, and we got through its same results. Yeah. Too. <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, but our, our, our brand archetype 
is the explorer, explorer mm -hmm. the explorer. So the under the explorer is all these things like adventure and trying new things never and, being comfortable yeah and which goes hand in hand with why we even chose our company name yeah so it was really interesting to see the results from that mm -hmm. and then from that stemmed a lot of brand identity and, yeah mm -hmm. got it and visual <laughs> and and then and then the, the the process after that was kind of starting to become pinned down and there's a, a like a, a psychology behind it all the some of the things that you want to be expressed what was the what, what sorts of things did you then develop as kind of marketing assets if you like um so sh they did a whole entire um style guide so um we had our fonts um you know our title fonts we had our brand main logo secondary logo um colors and when to use those colors um we actually have our own blue pencil blue now. Um, and then at biz, right down to business cards, how we sign off on an email um, or any type of letter. Uh, every, it literally is collateral that covers all spectrums of a business. Our proposals are brand, heavily branded. Right. And they're very interactive. So technology is something that's really big with us too, mm -hmm. especially in this industry. So it's always fun when we bring up our proposals because they're live and they're interactive. And so, um, you know, just showing the world and our clients too, that we're forward thinking is right. really important with the brand as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's everything. Yeah. And then from there it was, how does this apply to our website? Um, and in order to have the, um, collateral for the website how do we photograph our projects mm -hmm. um so it was really this holistic approach to bpc got it did you have to re-photograph any work or because i mean often i hear when people do go through like a, a large like a rebranding or a brand evolution that they'll often hire a photographer and then they'll re-photograph projects that have been photographed in the past to get more consistency did you do anything like that or i don't know that we re-photographed no. old projects but it was actually good timing where we had several new projects com um completing so um we ended up doing i think like three photo shoots within like a couple weeks which was a really big endeavor for the whole team but um was probably one of my favorite moments in the last couple years so amazing yeah um i think also it was okay for us we decided for us and the brand team to see the evolution of the company and to let people know it's okay like you don't start where we are right now yeah um yeah. that's not it's not realistic and mm -hmm. that's something we've always wanted to show small business owners is that you know a lot of companies you see after they are successful and big and and it seems easy and um to just let people know that small is creating your own business from scratch it isn't easy and there is evolution and it takes time and the lessons learned and all of that so um that ultimately became you know sort of the visual and seeing where we started and how we got to where we are in terms of your own business evolution, um, how many people are there now in your team? Seven. Yeah. yeah. Seven, 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 seven years. Seven. <laughs> Lucky seven. So, so yep. the seven, seven of you, how, how has your role changed since the, over the last seven years? What do, you, <laughs> what do you find yourself doing more of now that you didn't expect that you would have been doing? Um, and what's the kind of the day-to-day yeah, what's what's the role? What's your role evolution as practice leaders? Well, every day is different. Yep, <laughs> every day is very very different. Um, I think what the hardest thing for us to nail down was what I what is um, my strengths versus what are Casey's strengths, and mm. then really being able to to separate those roles because we have our hands in everything as partners, but 
Um, you know, I typically like to do construction administration and I love the whole being on the job site and talking with the contractors and problem solving the construction details. So um, I have moved further away from the design aspect and more into that role. And I never thought I would like project management. Management, mm -hmm. In fact, I was like anti project management and now I actually love it. And what's weird about that is I am the least organized person <laughs> in the world <laughs> that you will ever meet. So um, the fact that I love that aspect is, has really been pretty crazy and not something I would have ever seen. Like I don't, I don't like calendars. I don't even understand calendars. So it's I been an opportunity to, to, to express that deep level yeah. of organization and you didn't know was there. Yeah. Yeah. It's really been that maybe that's what it is, is that like, wow, I really can actually manage people on a calendar and times and stuff. So um, that's been really interesting. And, mm -hmm. and then I've always been really passionate about design and um, just the artistic reasoning behind every decision. Mm -hmm. um, I come from an art and art history background. So um, that's always been ingrained in me. So we, uh, love to do everything together, but I think we've realized that we can't do everything all the time. Um, and I surprisingly love the operations of the business. And um, I continue to learn and um, see that as a challenge where I can always um, learn something new and apply it to other areas of the business or of life. So um, it's been really fun to find each of our roles. Um, very naturally how how have you evolved and refined some of the business systems in the firm and to kind of Ooh. like you know be better tracking with money and keeping projects profitable or is still some of that still a challenge or how do you how do you guys approach it um i think we'll always be learning i mean we neither of us have a like business degree or background. Um, we're doing this because we love it and we love to learn and challenge ourselves. So mm -hmm. um, I think it'll be an ongoing um, learning experience and um, always look for ways that we can improve things and efficiencies. Um, I don't think there's one way of doing things. We've read a, like books on how to do your business and how to track everything. And um, we take what we need from all of those. But um, at the end of the day, I think we do really good at regrouping and really figuring out what's best for us in the business because it's not a one size fits all. And I also really believe in bringing in the experts for mm. certain aspects of your business and making sure that you have those people on hand um, at the beginning, you know, we didn't even know what experts we needed to have. Um, we knew really nothing about financials of a business. We didn't know what a PL was. Um, <laughs> we had no idea. Um, we didn't understand taxes and this tax structure of businesses. Yeah. So that's really heavy stuff. And the whole financial aspect of a small business, any type of small business is pretty pretty intense. And so um, we have a fantastic um, accountant who uh, helps us through a lot of uh, understanding of different statements and all of that. We also have a um, fantastic bookkeeping um, company that uh, keeps us on track that way. Um, so I highly recommend um, for anyone to get to get the best bookkeeper an accountant that you can, and that will help you really through some of those challenging things. I, I, when it's I think that, that, that's really solid advice. And there's so many people actually will try and do the bookkeeping and the accounting themselves. And mm -hmm. it's just frightening. You know, it's, yeah. It's and what happens is we try to do it ourselves. And then it, when we started to get bigger, it was like, okay, now we absolutely have to have a bookkeeper. And when yeah. they came in, it took them almost a year to clean everything up. So <laughs> it certainly didn't save us any money to do it ourselves. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. So definitely get yourself some, a, C, a good CPA and a good bookkeeper. 
That's very, very insightful. In terms of winning work, how do you, how has that changed since the beginning? So you were saying, you know, the first project you had um, was, was a, 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 a cabin that kind of expanded in size and became very substantial. How have you won work since then? And how do you continue to, to win work? Is it, are you more networkers or do you have digital marketing out or advertising or is it re- a lot of it referral based? A lot of it is referrals, um, but now we're starting to dabble in PR and um, what we can do differently with marketing. Um, so now we've um, actually brought on someone for that specific role. So it'll be really interesting to see how um, that sort of investment in a not just a role, but financially, how that changes, um, how we start to bring in some of these projects. And Previously, up until the last year, we had not done any paid advertising Mm -hmm. or PR. It was all um, earned earned media opportunities, which weren't a lot. Um, But now we've really uh, amped up that that part of the business. Now that we, we wanted to wait until we had a really good process and foundation down as a business before we started really putting ourselves out there heavily. So mm-hmm. now that we're doing that, but going back to your question on um, where do we see our, how do, how have our roles changed or what do we see ourselves doing that we didn't think we would? And I think something I had no idea about um, was the amount of networking you do as a business owner and how you have to show up um, in so many ways and in so many places. And um, it's very, it's, it takes a lot of energy (laughs) and you kind of always have to be on. Um, So that was something I've, I've never really had to do prior to this um, position. And it's not something that comes natural to me. And what's Mm -hmm. funny is I, I talk a lot, a lot, and I don't know when to stop, as you can tell. And Casey, <laughs> Casey doesn't talk very much on the daily, but when we are in a networking setting, she is a rock star. And I'm kind of like, I don't know what to say or do. It's so I'm interesting. Sure. It's so interesting. So it totally switches. And then I yeah. just follow her around because I'm like, <laughs> I'll let her just, she's, she's great at this. I'm just going to stay in the background. Well, but that, yeah, that's, networking is huge. Again, that's, that's very insightful what you say about, um, you didn't realize like how you're going to have to be like on so much of the time. And you never know when you could be talking to a prospective mm-hmm. client and, actually you know you've got to make these decisions of is this event worth the one is it should i go and do it or should i be should i be doing the work or should we be looking at the accounts and there's a a whole world of stuff that suddenly you know opens up that you didn't realize that you had to be responsible for tell us a little bit about bringing on team members because this isn't easy and (laughs) it it's difficult to find the right people it's difficult to have people actually stick around once you have found the talent um now we're in the world of kind of communication and group dynamics and people and emotions and tensions and all this kind of stuff how have you built a team and what have been some of the challenges that you've experienced and how have you overcome some of those challenges challenges is is one way my, yeah one way to put it <laughs> um i think the generational differences too are huge um i in my generation when i grew up it was like i was told you know i have a baby and i better be back on the work floor by within an hour later so it's like you need to be working you need to be working but you need to be working and yeah. um i think that you know a lot of that is changing. There's different ways of working now than, for, than in me and for you too. Mm-hmm. Um, so un- I think one of the things is just understanding that the way people work differently and how the generations work differently, and then finding a way to work with that um, is a challenge in and of itself. Mm-hmm. And then um, 
finding the right fit of people so you can look at a portfolio that's fantastic and um we used we love everyone so literally (laughs) everyone we would meet we'd be like you're hired you're hired you're hired (laughs) and so um it then later we'd be like you know really liking someone as a person is very different than you know who is the right person for this particular role um so with technology now it's been really awesome because uh we've taken a lot of uh we've taken advantage of it in terms of having a lot of consultants first and Mm -hmm. it's kind of a trial period for them and for us um and using that time to see if we're a good fit before we um commit to full employment so um that's been amazing and Mm -hmm. um really been success the most successful um staffing Mm -hmm. process we've had to date is um having that trial period Mm -hmm. and we have found people through word of mouth we get a lot of applications and portfolios sent to us um and then we've used um hiring apps too Mm -hmm. so well i think finding someone that fits well within a small business too because Mm -hmm. that is very different than a larger corporation um so finding someone that has the ability to fill other roles and wear a lot of hats because we do too. And when something comes in where um, we need someone to jump into a different role, they're open and willing to yeah. do so. And so a lot of times that happens organically too. We'll be working with someone and we notice something and we're like, we didn't know you could do that. And like, we want you to do more of that if you mm-hmm. want to. And um, so it's, it's really fun to see other people um, learn and evolve in what they want to do as well. And I think for me personally, one thing that has been really interesting is I was always um, on the employee side and obviously, and then now as a business owner and a leader and um, an employer, it's very different to see how I used to, the things that I used to bring to my boss and be, you know, like maybe crying about that I need this, I need that, and like, I'm not going to do this, and I don't want to do that. And I, you know, it's just funny, because I'm like, that was me. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting to have seen both sides. both sides of the coin in terms of employee versus employer and the challenges of both. I think that's a very kind of well-rounded perspective is to have that, is to have the experience Mm -hmm. of both. And I I know certainly from my own experience, where I look back on how I was as an employee and I think, okay. (laughs) (laughs) How how much I didn't, how much I didn't realize what was happening and, and, and the risks that, business owners were taking in order for me to be able to to be there there was uh, you know not I didn't I just didn't understand didn't understand the 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 mechanisms that were at at play and why certain things were the way they were and this is mm-hmm. also interesting in in terms of you know when we talk about leadership and we will often talk about transparency and how certainly like I would say that older generation of architectural design practices it's always been closed doors and not going to give you much information. Yes. And now we're starting to see actually, and certainly when, when you're talking about the, this generational uh, difference, that actually transparency is very useful and very, and very powerful in, in being able to empower other people to see where their position is in the, in the organization and also see here's what other people are dealing with to make the, mm-hmm. to make the ship just go forward. This, yes. is the, this, is, this is the energy that's being required and that can be quite, um, you know, quite, quite profound, actually. It, yes. Interesting, you, you were talking about finding the right fit and making the distinction between liking somebody and, you know, can they actually do the job? And this is really difficult, actually. And, mm-hmm. and like hiring is a really emotional, like we're trying not to be emotional about it. But you get into a conversation and if you're empathetic and a, a good person, you, you can connect with someone and you, it's intoxicating. You yes. Can, you can literally be like, oh, 
wow, they're, 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 they're so great. They're amazing. And then it's difficult to not let that color the, you know, well, are they competent? How are they going to, how are they going to behave under stress? How, mm-hmm. how are they going to take instruction? How are they going to take direction? How are they going to, how are they going to respond when they're being held accountable? Which is totally different relationship to like a, like a friend dynamic or a, a peer dynamic. And I think mm-hmm. that for, for business owners is actually, it's, it's quite a, it's quite eye opening. It's quite a, a learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake that we've made in the past, Mm -hmm. especially in a small office, because, you know, we hear everything each other's doing, we end up, you know, chit chatting. And I think in the past, we have definitely made that mistake of getting too in close with employees and them almost probably both of us taking advantage of the situation a little bit or, you know, taking it one step too far where you're not a leader anymore or seen as a leader, you're seen as equals. Um, and not that we're all about hierarchy or anything, but there has to be some level of, um, you know, professional uh, boundaries boundaries there. And, um, yeah. And so now that is something we are very, very careful of, um, and trying to keep that, you know, let, it's like, we let ourselves go a little bit into that friend role, you know, to make everyone comfortable and create the the environment that you're speaking of that, you know, where you're, it's free to express yourself and all of that, but then still keeping that boundary there and letting it be known. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that is, it's not easy to do that. And it kind of depends on the, on, you know, your personalities and perhaps there's a, a natural tendency just to want to be friends and mm-hmm. actually, you know, the, the hierarchical structures that, that a business needs it, a business needs the, a business needs leadership and it needs hierarchy and it needs structure. I'm often very concerned when I speak with, you know, design firms and they'll say, oh, we're a completely flat, a flat structure. And Mm. either that means that there's a bottleneck in the business where (laughs) decisions don't get made very well and it's going to be very difficult, or they're talking about something more general, like, you know, when we design, everyone is around the table and everyone can, can chip in ideas. Cause that's different. That's not, that's yes. not high. That's not an organizational hierarchy. That's, that's right. getting everyone's creative input and, you know, having a young designer sit at the table with the senior designs, that's very beneficial. And that's a, that can open up and create dialogue, but you know, Absolutely. somebody's got to be leading, leading the practice and has to make decisions about it. And not everyone is always going to be enrolled in it. But, it, mm-hmm. but there needs to be trust in the in the leader who's who's doing that. How do you how do you do it together as friends? That's hard too. That's <laughs> I would say we say we're basically married, so it's like <laughs> it's hard. It's just like a marriage. I mean, friends, it, <laughs> yeah, most days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is, it's not all bells and whistles. We do just like a marriage have to work through. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the hardest things probably in our lives at certain points, um, we really have to stay. We have to just remember that in the end, we're on the same side and we love each other. So mm-hmm. how do we make it through this together um, ultimately? But um, I think defining our roles is something that has helped us a lot in terms of, you know, we, like Casey said, we used to say, well, we both are going to do construction management, you know, and then it turns out that one of us doesn't like a certain aspect or does like it. And I, you know, or we're both going to do design and one of us might struggle in that. And then trying to put that um, amount of pressure on each other for that. It's like, you finally realize like, wait, maybe we just need to separate this differently. So it's a lot of trial and error, a lot of trust. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. trust is absolutely the foundation of making a partnership work. Um, And then just respecting each other and knowing that we each offer something different to this business. And they're both very, although very different, both very valuable. Mm -hmm. Um. And surprisingly, overall, over the seven years, I feel like there's never really been a need for a third party to step in and make 
any decisions. Um, we're yeah. equal, which everyone said that's not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, it, yes, we, we understand now after seven years why people would say that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, overall, we tend to agree pretty much on the big decisions and when they need to be made and what is the right for the business. We always say what's right for the business first mm -hmm. and then go from there. That's that, again, it's interesting you bring up uh, in general business advice, the 50, 50 partnership is always very risky. Very. Um, <laughs> because you know, it, you can get to us, you can really get to a stalemate, stalemate position and then that can kind of hinder the business yes all together and so having the philosophy of like okay well what what serves the business is pretty key yeah and i think just on the more personal side so there's a business aspect of that of like the decision making and um and everything but then and the money splitting obviously that is based on the percentage of ownership um but it's also a mindset so mm -hmm. if we're 50 50 um you can get caught up in this, like, well, I'm actually doing more and than she is, but we're getting paid the same or we have the same rights and all of this or, and vice versa, you know, like, so you got to be really careful or I'm working these hours and she's not and all that. So you have to be really careful to not let that start to um, cloud your vision of what mm -hmm. reality is. How do you, how do you broach those sorts of difficult conversations with each other? Um, without, without it building up honestly, into resentment and, and then exploding. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, it usually gets to the point where it's like, we hold it in, hold it in. And then if there's an yeah. explosion, <laughs> then we work through it. And it's like any relationship yeah. is just figuring out the balance uh, between two people. Yep. Is mm -hmm. what it comes down to. And really learning that that differences are good. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a morning person. She's a night person. Not so, anymore. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> evolutionizing too. But typically, that's how it's been. And so then it's like, well, I'm online at 5 and she's online at midnight, you know. And so we're two ships sailing in the night in that regard. And so you just have to realize, like, that's when she works best. Mm -hmm. This is when I work best. And so just... Having, it's a lot of um, self-reflection, I would say more than anything is, is really what we've learned, especially me is like understanding what's truth and, and self-reflecting and, mm -hmm. and in, in totality, it makes me a better person in life realizing that. So, and there's, and there's also like in the context of the relationship, there's the, you know, a commitment to each other and to the business. Yes. Uh, and I, I, cause I think that's really important actually, is that you guys, you know, you, there's a, there's a space where you're, you're okay with having the arguments and mm -hmm. like whatever way it comes out, as long as it comes out and if it's a bit of a, you know, shouting at each other for a little bit and then it dies down, whatever that, but there's, it's inside of the framework of being committed to, to, to the business or committed to something ideal. And there's a commitment to also being able to work it out. And a, yes. and a trust that it can be worked out through, yep. through speaking. That's that's a you know kind of the challenge of the relationship, but also the reflection of it being of it working and it being yep. healthy. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I think it's a perfect <laughs> place to conclude the conversation there. Very inspiring stuff. Thank you so much uh for your time and for giving us a little peek uh behind yes. the scenes of uh, of of the business so i really appreciate uh, your contributions today and uh, you sharing your expertise thank you so much ryan it was a joy to be here mm -hmm. and that's a wrap and one more thing if you haven't already please do head on over to itunes or spotify and leave us a review we'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. And now a word from today's sponsor. A while ago, I began to hear reports of a company that was helping some of our clients build remote teams. We looked into it more closely and discovered the company World Teams that was helping small architectural practitioners build remote teams that were both capable and qualified. 
I was intrigued by another business that's addressing one of the critical pain points for small architectural practices, which is the ability to grow and shrink a team effectively, to be able to handle higher workflow without having to staff up significantly and also being very sensitive about labor costs. World Teams is built to address these issues. World Teams is a small but mighty company that helps architectural practices build high-performing remote teams quickly and efficiently, saving you the headache of sorting resumes and interviewing underqualified candidates. World Teams operates in your time zone and prioritizes near-native English speakers, ensuring clear and efficient communication with your remote team members. They have flexible contracts so you can adjust your team size as your needs evolve. Additionally, you're connected directly with your skilled professionals, which fosters trust and collaboration. And World Teams helps you reduce your operating costs without compromising the quality that is so important to a practice. To download a free guide for building a remote team for a small architectural practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. That's one word, businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. As a reminder, sponsorship is not an endorsement and you must do your own due diligence before entering into any business relationship. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash world teams. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.